everyone this is jennifer hellman and welcome to air we are doing a video with kip baldwin who is like one of my favorite people the energy right now is really shifting so i really am doing a series of interviews with some of the major healers and people in the know so kip and it's an awesome I, to see you this time well let me say that you're one of my favorite people too and this is a great time for us to be having a conversation we haven't had one in in a while uh there used to be quite a bit more regular and then just i, I think we've both been uh, working on things trying to get ourselves centered balanced figured figure out what's going on here with all the energies that are as they're swirling around right now and um, I, I think it's good. I think we, this is a good time for us to reconnect and have an in-depth conversation about just what the hell is going on. Okay, so what the hell is going on? From your point of view, from what you're getting, what is going on? Well, uh, let, maybe I should back up a little bit, give a little introduction to your audience. Um, you know, so Jennifer and I have known each other, well, gosh, going on like a decade now, crazy. It's been, it's yeah. been literally like, yeah, it's a long eight, time. Yeah. And um, in that time, when I first met Jennifer, I was, I just had sort of an, uh, while this has been a lifelong journey for me, um, I didn't really realize exactly the journey I was on until about eight years ago when I walked into a room of uh, filmmakers, an event that I was putting together. And I realized I was in love with everyone in the room. And I realized in that moment that not only is that how we can feel about everyone and everything, but it's, it's really how we should feel about it. I mean, should being, you know, let's throw the word should out. It's how we could feel about everyone if we choose to. Mm -hmm. and, and everything, life, you know, everything in life. There's nothing to fear. There's nothing to hate. Um, there's no reason we can't have that sense of that, that falling in love feeling all the time, that first kiss feeling all the time. And so I said about, um, with my just love movement at that point, which is about the time that Jennifer and I really started talking, she'd, she'd helped me work uh, through some stuff. I'd, I'd lost um, someone really significant in my life uh, that it was a pretty hard um, death to deal with. And Jennifer was really there and helped uh, sort of guide me through that. And um, so for that, I'm ever grateful. And um, I, for eight years, I was, or seven years or so, I've been doing uh, every day, I've been posting something about love and enlightenment uh, that comes to me from my daily meditation um about a year ago oh you got to see up on the hill here i'm outside and there's this, this giant jackrabbit up on the hill it's so beautiful um anyway about a year ago i um got connected with a gentleman named evan hirsch who was on his own journey and we joined forces and we formed this thing called now share love um <clears throat> and what now share love originally was was as um, originally Evan had had this awakening because of the Bernie Sanders campaign. And when that all went away and he is a philanthropist and wanted to put money to help, uh, help with Bernie's campaign. But once Bernie's campaign went away, he and I both agreed that fighting against what is really wasn't the best path forward. That as long as we're fighting against what is, we are propping up what is. We're not, we're not really offering solutions. We're not offering a better way forward. And that's what re people really want. And boy, was this um, demonstrated to me. We were invited um, um, because of our involvement with the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love, which I'll go into more detail about. We were invited to be part of the, uh, um, the, of the LGBT Pride Parade. And um, can you still see me? I can see you just fine. Okay, you went away for some reason. I'm, I'm seeing this very interesting, almost... Um, cat's eye black and white circle in the middle of my screen that's interesting so is that I, I can see, i can see you fine okay then we'll keep going um so anyway uh we we took part in lgbt uh, lgbt pride and the interesting thing about this is we were part of the summer of love contingent because they realized this being the 50th anniversary they wanted something about love equality where all this started from 50 years ago mm -hmm. or in large part it took form um, so we were on the magic bus and we're just blaring. All you need is love because June 25th, which was the date of the pride parade was also the 50th anniversary of the Beatles global sing along for all you need is love. Mm -hmm. Well, the interesting thing was, is we were right behind the resist 
contingency. And they were resisting Donald Trump. They were angry and they were this up in the air. And, and I'm not taking away from their feelings of, I've got to do something. I've, I've, I've got to fight this or whatever. I, I get it. I've been there. But the, the change of energy as they would pass and then here we come in this magic bus and we're blaring out all you need is love and getting everyone to sing along. It just, dem and, the, and the shift in energy that took place um, really illustrated to me how important this idea of bringing solutions, love source solutions to, to the table uh, for people offering them, um, you know, a direction to go in. Um, back up a little bit. So when Evan and I decided to do Now Share Love, Summer of Unconditional Love Soul, we uh, had no idea it was the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love. Um, we, we got immersed in all of the events and, and it's really been quite remarkable year because what they've done is instead of demonizing and marginalizing the movements and, and the people of that era, um, they've embraced it. And every museum in California is doing something. Well, not every, that's an exaggeration, but a lot of the major museums in California, um, are doing ex exhibitions surrounding the summer of love and what it stood for whether it's the art the the changes that came from it recycling mm -hmm. so you know civil rights movements all of these things um and in the in the course of the year boy has there been a lot of um personal awakening that's gone or, or, or more let me say not awakening but um a further awakening a further understanding of the story that we're a part of and um so now here we are uh, we're, we're coming in, we're in the middle of this summer of love. We're actually just about a month, uh, you know, a little less than a month into it. Um, although it's been going on since, uh, the actual human being was on January 14th. And, and I see while I look around the world and, um, and I was just writing something about this today. Um, while I look around the world and I understand people's angst, I understand their frustration, I understand the despair, I understand their fear. But I see nothing but hope right now. And the reason I see hope is because by being involved with uh, these summer 50th anniversary um, events, happenings, what, I, what I've been able to make note of is the things that led us out of the original summer of love are the things that are leading us into the summer of love. And what I mean by that is, so what happened at the end of the summer of love? Well, you had Nixon in the White House. Okay, we've got Trump now. Um, you had Nixon demonizing cannabis, even though his advisors told him not to. Well, why did he do that? He did that to dis to really destroy the counterculture, which he saw as a great threat to the, to the um to the old white boys power base, mm -hmm. and um and also the demonization of psychedelics, just to name a few. Well, now what's going on? Well, cannabis is becoming legal in more and more states in this country. But globally, it, there's talk of a global into the moratorium, a global into the prohibition, a global into maybe even the whole war on drugs. Um, so there, there's a positive. Um, we're seeing psychedelics being embraced instead of demonized as these things that you'll take and they'll lose your mind. They're using them now in therapy, the way they were meant to be used. They're using them to treat soldiers with PTSD. There are people who have suffered from lifelong depressions now a depression that have suffered from um, that are using psilocybin mushrooms and going through one round of therapy, facing their fears and coming out the other side and completely over their depression mm -hmm. um, and on and on and on. So we've got a re-embracing of psychedelics, which were embraced before the sixties and before there was the moral backlash because of what, um, uh, because of the drastic change that, they brought about by awakening the, the consciousness and the hippies and the freaks and, and the other um, uh, groups in that era. Um, so that's a positive. The cannabis seems a positive. And while Trump's a negative, it's heading into this summer. So I really feel that we have yet to imagine what we can be coming out of this. And because the last summer of love ended so, um, so horribly, if you will, or mm -hmm. faced with so many challenges, um, I'm really hopeful that we'll come out of this um, with something we haven't even imagined yet. And, and I think it's going to be really beautiful. And, and, you know, at least that's, that's my feeling. And I sort of feel that what's happened from then to now can be really described as the hero's journey. Um, and the, the hero would be the awakening consciousness, 
consciousness that that took place and that call to adventure oh my god i'm awake i'm aware i've got all these new ideas things aren't going right we've got war and all of these things and and they made their you know they made their presence known it made its presence known in the world then it got its challenge it had to go out in the world and have its adventures face its challenges overcome these things now it's coming back to the tribe and said okay i've gone out in the world we've won a lot of the cultural wars now we're figuring out how to address the systemic um, issues that we face whether it's economic political, environmental, on and on and on, um, or just moving from a foundation of institutionalized fear to one of love. Um, and I, and I, I think we're going to do that. And I think some of the most remarkable things that when, when I was 12 years old, and Jennifer's heard this story about a million times at this point, would probably rather I not repeat it again. Yeah. But when I was 12 years old, I had this experience with infinity where um, and, and I grew up in a small town in Washington. We raised horses, farm boy, you know, astral projection, out of body experiences, not something we talked about. I'd never used drugs yet. I hadn't drank or anything at 12. Um, and my dad and I'd gone up to see a, a football game in Seattle, got home and I was really tired and I, I left my body and I floated out over my bedroom and then I left my house. And, and just to back up a second, as I float out over my bedroom, there was a hesitation over my body to make me aware that I wasn't in my body anymore. And then out of the house, off the planet, out of the solar system, out of the galaxy, out of the universe, but taking it all in as I was going. And then I was turned in to face um, the universe itself. Well, it was finite, it fit in my head. And then I was turned out towards blackness, just blackness. And that's where I came face to face with the concept, the idea of infinity and what infinity really is is that infinite unknowable that we could be for a trillion years and never be closer to gaining a complete understanding of what it is than than right now um and it also uh, gave me so on one level it said okay you don't have to be af afraid of the unknown which is one of the main things we're controlled and manipulated by mostly through our fear of death um and have been for thousands Okay, Kip, you're frozen. Oh, there you are. Yeah, we're we're not we're not in in flow right now. Frozen was a, a great word throw. <laughs> we are kind of frozen. Okay, uh, okay, you're you're like blacking out and coming back in. So hmm. talk again. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um. Where, where did where did I get left off there? No, you said you used the word frozen is a great way a great word to use right now. Yeah, you, you, well, you happened to say, as I was talking about being that we're not in flow, you use the word frozen uh, to describe our technology. Right now. But it's a really appropriate word to use right at that moment, um, because we have been frozen in space and time and our understanding. We want this, we, we've, our irrational desire to have some sort of everlasting permanence has only led to a great deal of suffering. And now we're at a point where We've had spiritual understandings that have been trying to tell us this for thousands of years, whether it's uh, from the Christian belief system of, you know, you're not your body. You know, we're all parts of God. We're all sons and daughters of God. Um, you know, we can leave this body anytime we like. We're more than this than this mortal shell. Going back to Buddha, same thing, crossing rivers, you know, uh, being able to move through space and time. Um, these are spiritual understandings that have been shared for tens of thousands of years, if not longer. We, we, quite frankly, we at this point don't know even our own history for sure. But what's happened is that science has caught up with our spiritual understandings. And I really feel that science has always been meant to be used as a tool to help um, move us beyond the material. And once it got to this place, now we're, we're reaching a place where there's nothing to stop us from embracing that we aren't the reflection in the mirror, that we aren't made of matter. In fact, the amount of matter in your body wouldn't be, um, if you took all the nothing away, wouldn't be able to be seen under a microscope. The amount of actual matter in the entire galaxy is equivalent to a grain of sand on a beach. So when we're looking at these new understandings, say in physics, where you've got quantum, you get down far enough, and even physicists, Michael deGrasse Tyson talks about, they don't know what matter is made of now. That, that's not me making this up, that 
research mm -hmm. it. It's out. Um, there's a film called Resonance Beams of Frequency that um, takes on another one of the fundamental uh, belief systems of science, which is that life must come from life. The doctor who this, uh, won the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering the AIDS virus was doing some experiments on water memory. And he, I don't know exactly how he inadvertently did this, but like all great discoveries, this was an accident. He put 7.83 hertz through water, which is the same frequency as the planet, which is the same frequency as your brain waves. And it's the only frequency that he could replicate this with, or even get this uh, particular outcome to occur. And what happened was nothing short of miraculous. DNA formed from nothing in the water just by putting this frequency from it. So does life have to come from life? Apparently not. And then beyond that, this DNA once formed in these test tubes was communicating with each other between test tubes with the same frequency creating new DNA. Um, so these are just two of our scientific understandings that are begging us to question, what are we? What are we, and, and if we're not matter, how do we apply these new understandings to our way of being? Um, and one thing that came to me after you and I talked the other day, and it was just so stupidly obvious, I don't know why I hadn't put it together. Um, I, I'm, at, I'm asked numerous times, well, okay, Kip, you know, how do I apply that in my life? How is that going to change, you know, the fact that I need to feed my family? How's that going to change the fact that I need clothes on my back to put a roof over my head? And, and in general, I, 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 I haven't had a really good understanding. I basically parroted something that Michael deGrasse Tyson told Bill Maher um, when asked about dark matter in the universe and how that would affect things. And Michael deGrasse Tyson said, he said, I, I'm going to tell you this. He said, I don't know, but I know that it will. <clears throat> and I thought that was a pretty good, that was a nice breadcrumb to this understanding that came in the past couple of days, which is, okay, if we can manifest, and we now understand that we can manifest DNA from nothing, and that matter is made of nothing, then we now are at the very basic of what life is, of what matter is, of what this, of what creation is, of what this story is. So there's no reason we can't manifest anything that we need, anything even that we want. But I do feel that we won't be able to embrace those understandings and implement those um, um, new ways of being until we have, until we remember our innate connection to everything. Well, to make a few comments on the things you said about the frequency, overall, we're energy. So our thoughts are energy. That's how we manifest. What you, what you ask for, you receive. So to make life from adding frequency to nothing, to me, it's like, duh, of yes. course you're going to make DNA. Right. You're going to be able to create life because in truth, we're all energy. So, um, but the understanding of the highest vibration is love, love, music, art. It's all very high vibration because it lifts us up from all the dark matter that has penetrated us with the materialistic greed, all the things of me, 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 I need to, I need this, I need this. But if you relax and say, I know I'm, I'm okay, everything seems to really unfold so beautifully. The more I relax and say, okay, I know I need this, you take care of that spirit. Before I know it, it happens. I'm just trusting that it's a done deal. And the more you just relax and not really worry and panic and get so upset about the smallest details, the universe will let you know what you need to do, where you need to be. And that really is empowering once you allow your inner essence really bloom and listen follow through because as soon as you do that material situation you know it's taken care of one way or another you're going to be okay 
and and I and I agree with you um, absolutely, and and of course you and I know that, and I would even take it one step further. My my understanding and and things that um, there's there's a school of thought out there that beyond energy, we're information, and mm -hmm. that everything's gathered into different forms, energy forming into matter, blah blah blah. And while you and I understand that and have understood this on an intuitive and innate and instinctive level, which everyone should, because it's there in you if you open yourself up to it and, and start coming from heart-based thinking instead of mind-based thinking and open your third eye, your pineal gland, um, you'll all of a sudden become more aware of this. But I think the good thing about having these new scientific understandings is it gives us tools as teachers and guides to say, Hey, it, it's not just us out here being spiritual. Ooh, ooh. No, this is real <laughs> stuff that they've proven now, folks. So what's your excuse? What's stopping you from manifesting the life you want? What's stopping us from manifesting the life we want? There isn't anything anymore except our beliefs. Our beliefs mm -hmm. shape our stories, uh, personally and collectively. And so as we're changing our belief, and I think the other thing about frequency that's interesting is the 7.83 hertz it's not a coincidence that it's the same frequency as the planet. It's not a coincidence it's the same frequency as our um, brain waves. That's the same frequency that can manifest DNA. Um, and and why specifically that? And why is that not can't? Why is that impossible for it to be a coincidence? Well, there are literally infinite frequencies from smallest to largest. The universe itself has its own wavelength. So, I kind of feel like. We can tune in like tuning into a radio and do yes. any story we want. And I think that's what we're doing right now. We're tuning. And right now we're in that in-between place where we're hearing static and it's really, oh, uh, it's uncomfortable. And I'm trying to figure out where, where's that next station I want to tune into. I want to tune into classical rock, whatever. Um, and, and we're in that thing of finding that new vibration, of finding that frequency to tune into and what story of what story we're going to tell next. Well, don't you think because of almost the divine timing of the summer of love and the music within the summer of love back in 67, the amazing amount of empowering, loving, embracing, yet there was some that were very much a protest song at the same time, but with the essence of, we need to love ourselves enough to stop the wars, yep. to look at other ways of doing things. So it's it, to me, it's like such divine timing of the shift that's going on. I mean, planetarily, the alignments are so similar to the same thing back in the 60s. And so it's, it's like, interesting that, that, that cycles of enlightenment, um, from what I understand, go in 50-year cycles. Yeah. And so it, it shouldn't be surprising to us at all that, that here we are and that these things are aligning. And, and you said something that is so important for everyone to understand, is this all has to start with us. While we are collected, uh, part of a collective, universally, infinitely, um, and also within ourselves, I think what a lot of people don't understand is that we are not a singular organism. When you look in the mirror, that reflection is only about 10% human DNA. The rest of it is flora, fauna, bacteria, our cell, just all of these other universes and organisms and things that are happening within, in us that we wouldn't be without. So understanding that quite literally, it has to start with us. We have to start by loving ourselves. We have to start by cherishing <clears throat> what we are both internally and externally it's not in to me it's not about an internal seeking or an external seeking it's about a whole seeking it's about an absolute understanding and what one thing um and oh one thing before i forget i do want to touch on what you said about music i just started watching a series um called long the long strange trip and it's about the grateful dead now i'll be honest with you, i i i'm not a huge grateful dead fan um, it wasn't a, a music that I gravitated to when I was growing up. Um, but, in, and I, I appreciated what they did, but I always thought of them as, some, as a product of the 60s, as something that, oh, here's a band that joined in the acid trips. Here's a band that joined in the, you know, the, the Kool-Aid experiments and Ken Kesey and the Ma Mary Pranks, that they were something that became 
a product of what happened in the 60s. What Dennis McNally documents in this in this series, and I, I've had the uh, real honor of, of interviewing Dennis, is that um, the the Grateful Dead were actually some of the foundational bricks of the 60s. Jerry Garcia wasn't this guy, hey, look, I'm gonna take some acid. Oh my God, I wanna you know be a part of this. No, he was part of the people that said, no, this is a thing that we're starting. This is a movement that we're a part of. This is an awakening that we're a part of. And I didn't know that till I started watching this film. And Jerry is such a remarkable guy. I mean, his whole thing was about creating tribe and having fun. It was never about anything, you know, so high-minded. It was just, let's have fun. Let's love one another. Let's, let's be good to one another. Let's, but let's have some joy in our lives. Um, <clears throat> so you're absolutely right. The music, everything that the 60s stood for vibrationally, it's here again now. And it's here again but it's being respected now. That's another big difference between them. Right. Then it's demonized. Now we're celebrating it. Now we're celebrating the art. Now we're celebrating the tremendous ideas that came out of that. And, that, and again, that it just fills me with so much hope. You know? Yeah. And, and we do have a lot of hope because, I mean, I'm feeling a difference of just talking to people and seeing so many people being so aware and willing to listen to a, a higher or a different perspective on the situation and not just automatically making a judgment, but speaking about the observations that are going on of the energy that is just flowing through us all right now. It is really intense right now. Oh, it's so, I mean, so intense. I mean, I, I, on one hand, I'm so hopeful, but I, I would be, I think it's, um, and, it, and maybe this isn't the way it is for everybody, but I, I certainly feel on a pretty regular basis, um, the challenge, the challenge. Mm -hmm. okay. are, are you sure that's what you believe? Are you really going to be the, you know, one of the standard bearers? Are you really going to go out and, and share that message? And it, and it, it comes, you, you've got to be ready to face those challenges. You've got to be ready to let go. And, and that's, that's something that, um, is an understanding that I want to share with people too, is this idea of letting go. I think that one of the things that holds people back from letting go and evolving and expanding is when they think of letting go, it sounds like you're losing something. Not so. It, it, it's an expansion of what you are. It's an enhancement of what you are. All you're letting go is your limitations. To, you're, you're moving from limitation to limitlessness. And people That's have the hardest time with that concept to understand that you're growing to your highest potential. You're not losing anything that is really valuable to you. Your memories are still there. The beliefs are shifting and bringing you to a new center and understanding of how expansive and powerful you are. The other day when we were talking and, and you gave me a very clear message to stop doubting what? my power. That was really, so remarkable. <laughs> and it was just like, when you were saying it, it's like, okay, this isn't Kip. Um, so you definitely would channel it. I mean, the energy was shift. And, and the message was exactly what I needed to hear. And I thank you and I thank John for that. Um, it was a very kind of like tap on the shoulder saying, we're with you. Yeah. You're not alone. Yeah. You are expanding, but stop doubting it. And, you know, I'd been starting to write more because I had really clammed up. I totally shut down. I went within myself and saying, I need to get rid of these blocks. I've created hell on earth instead of home on earth this heaven and that was a message i received very clearly this morning is to blend the earthly bound part of me with the essential me so i have heaven on earth right and and, and maybe we should explain a little bit so it doesn't seem people understand what we're talking about when we're talking about that experience we had shared uh, the other day um 
So what Jennifer's talking about is a, a dear friend of mine named Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Uh, she's known for a long, long time as Dr. Love, Hay House author, who Jennifer actually brought to my attention and said, you got to interview her. And um, little did, little did I think either Jennifer I know where that meeting was going for. <laughs> um, I certainly couldn't have fathomed it. Um, Jamie has such an amazing story. She, uh, eight years ago about, she wrote a book called Love Never Dies. Um, this is again, after years of her being a relationship counselor and just doing beautiful work of love and helping people learn how to better communicate with one another and help and, and boy, communication, people, words matter. The way we communicate mm -hmm. with each other, take time to listen, listen more, talk less. Um, we'll, I, we'll talk more about communication in a minute, but, um, so I was getting ready. I had a, a radio show then called the just love show, uh, which again, Jennifer and I were. I give Jennifer full credit for forcing me out of the, out of the nest and fly and do this radio show on your own. And um, anyway, so as I was getting ready to have Jamie as a guest on my show, um, I was listening to interviews she'd done with other folks. And I remember distinctly, I was driving by Dolores Park in San Francisco. And all of a sudden I felt this wave of energy wash over me. I'm going, okay, that's unusual. <laughs> um, and then I'm home and I'm, it's the morning of the interview, and I'm trying to turn the pages of her book, and I can't do it. I'm getting just overwhelmed with emotion. I literally can't turn the page of the book. I'm going, this is really weird. So Jamie and I start doing the interview, and it wasn't video. It was just straight audio. And uh, not long after we started uh, talking, Jamie's like, you're about to cry. There's no way she could have known. My voice wasn't shaking. My eyes were completely filled with tears. And she's like, Ja is in you now. Now, who's Ja? Well, Emile Jean Penn was um, a really revolutionary Jesuit priest. He founded liberation theology in the church. He fought for women's rights in the church. He fought for divorce in the church before being um, given the option to opt out <laughs> or, or being thrown out. Um, so Jamie, when she was a little girl, she had a vision of who her soulmate was going to be. She goes to Vassar. Now, she hadn't dated anybody her whole life. And she wasn't a religious person. This wasn't like, I'm, I'm remaining, you know, a virgin until I get married or whatever. In fact, she describes in her book how she was, uh, lived in a household of Jewish athe atheists whose only religion was hating one another. And yeah. so she goes to Vassar, where she's going to study sociology. And the, the, the classes are full. So they said, well, you got to go talk to the head of the department. So she goes to the head of the department. And who is it? It's Emile Jean Pen. That's her soulmate. That's the guy she saw when she was a little girl. They end up spending 28 years together, I think, total. And eight years ago, um, eight or nine years ago, uh, Jean passed. And he passed in front of her. They were vacationing in Italy and he got stung on a bee in the same place as the stigmata on his hand and he suffocated in front of her. She was beyond grief. She's in her hotel room. She feels a hand go down her back and she's like, Ja, he was there. He, communi he communicates with her all the time. And that's what her whole uh -huh. book, Love Never Dies, is about. Teaching people a new way to grieve. Teaching people that they're not gone from you. That there's only a thin veil. That's what Ja wants us to understand. Anyway, so from during that interview, it became more and more aware that Ja and I had this really amazing connection. He is... is is almost unbelievable it still sounds to me when I say it today, he considers me his son, his brother. And I, this is a guy that the Dalai Lama considered one of the 10 people closest to God. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when uh, Jen and I were talking um, a couple of days ago, um, she, she'd um, asked me a question and I uh, said that Jod ja just flashed the word warning to her. And yes. I didn't really know what it was. I didn't feel anything. All of a sudden, boy, did I suddenly know. And I, as I told her in the moment, I'm like, this isn't me talking right now. And every time he does this, I get so like, I don't want to share what he, like he'll send me a message to Jamie. I'm like, wow, I feel so, and because of our program, I feel so weird saying this stuff out loud. I'm like, nope. And, but he's very forceful. He yes, said, he you're is. Say, you're going to say this. And so I told Jen, I said, he's warning you that change, that change is here, that you need to embrace your power, that, that all the light workers do that we all need to be at the very top of our game right now. If we're going to help be a part of this shift, there can be no ambiguity about our message. We have to be 100% committed to the love we are. We have to be 100% 
committed to helping other people understand the love that they are. And now, now maybe it doesn't happen for everyone and that's okay. We're all a part of, these are all just stories. If you're ready to embrace that, great. If you're not, then, then don't, don't beat yourself up about it either. That won't get you to where you want to go. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to follow up on that because it certainly ties into this. <clears throat> we hear a lot of people talk about now and that there's only now. And that's true. Even from the perspective of infinity, you can't add or subtract to infinity. What is it? How do you add to something that is everything, nothing, and everything and nothing at all beyond mm -hmm. the absolute or beyond consciousness? It is the absolute that probably doesn't even totally know its own source because how could it? But you can't add or subtract to that. So everything that is, is. Now, what we perceive of is indescribably small in fact any experience you're having quite frankly is indescribably small in comparison to infinity there is no way to measure how minute of an experience you're having but we are we're just having this little tiny tiny perception of what now is um and in fact even alexander who wrote the book love never dies um touches on this and I, and i think it's worth sharing he described when he had his um, near-death experience, first he went through the earth, earthworm realm where he says very mechanical and tendril and mechanical noises and, and just all these things surrounding him before moving on to the more prototypical paradise, heaven floating in the air, flowers, beautiful music, beautiful people, beautiful woman guiding him along. Then he went to a third place. The third place was, as I described, the infinity before was absolute blackness. And there was a being there that he said he thought what was God, but he it described itself as Om. And even the spiritual beings couldn't comprehend what that was. And, and I think that, that there's so much truth in that. And, and one note I want to make about even is this was a, a hardcore scientist, atheist, who had no belief in any of this stuff at all. So when we're talking about the now, what are we really talking about? We're talking about perception. Mm -hmm. And so what are we talking about when we evolve? Um, because I, I'm sort of hung up on the word evolve right now, because if in fact infinity is what it is and you can't add or subtract to it, we're really not evolving. We're just changing the stories and we're expanding our perception. So right now, just from a human perspective, there's 7 billion different nows, 7 billion, 7 mm -hmm. billion nows happening right now, 7.5 five billion perspectives of what now is. Now imagine if we allow ourselves just to expand into those 7.5 billion perspectives of the human now. Whoa. Now yeah. I'm sharing in you without judgment, without recrimination. I'm getting to experience what Jen's life's like. How does Jen see the color blue? How does Jen right. feel the touch of the breeze on her cheek? Whatever. You know, then we start to move into this place of recon of that innate connection we all share. Now you get to a point where you're starting to think about all the other life on this planet, all the other organisms that we're part mm -hmm. of. Then you start expanding that out universally. And oh my God, now you start to get an idea of what now is and how it's literally just a matter, how you experience now is a matter of how expanded or limited you allow your perspective of what now is to be. Well, it's it's like early on when I really was focusing on my spirituality and finding everything out, I got a clear message. It's there's 360 degrees of perspective times 360 degrees. I mean, it's like full circle in every direction. There is a different direction, a different perspective. So mm -hmm. you have unlimited ways or there are billions of ways, as you mentioned, to really have that understanding. And I think after they gave me that is when I connected to someone very closely, but it was only spiritually. And it's like, I literally felt I was in the same room with this person and I was seeing through his eyes. I was feeling his emotions. I was seeing everything and feeling what he was feeling yet it took me a while to step back and understanding i was witnessing through him and not taking that energy on yeah. so there was a little bit of adjustment for me 
because it did throw me for a loop. It's like, okay, this is like a little bizarre. But at the same time, it also shows me the time that I was meditating. And in my meditation, I saw me looking at me from, I was laying down, so I was above me. I was standing next to my head and then totally circling me in every which way of visualizing me. Mm -hmm. And I could shift to each perspective watching me meditate. And that was a very interesting way. So there really were putting into me that there really is different perspectives in not to attach to just one. And, and you, what, what you did is you moved from the role of the participant being observed to the role of the observer participating. And so exactly. You, you got to observe this. Um, one, there's a, there's a really good fiction series out by the, um, the, the guys that did the Matrix and Wachowski, I think brothers is how you say their name. Um, it's called Sense Eight, and it's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And now, for me, one of the things I tell people all the time, and I know uh, some people think I'm a little bit crazy when I talk about this, but it feels to me like our next thing that we imagine ourselves being is much less physical, far mm -hmm. more spiritual. Which again, we've now proven science we're not physical, so yeah, we can be energy we can be information we can flow freely we don't have to be trapped and addicted to our reflection addicted to our things <clears throat> and so I, I i envision experience of self removed from ego that allows us to free flow from being to being from thing to thing from tree to gr blade of grass to dog to cat right. from one another really getting to experience what it's like to have these um experiences of different perspectives in this show sense eight that's what they touch on it's and that what the sense eights are is there an, an offshoot of humanity that literally flows and is connected on this spiritual level and they share in all these experiences of one another and i'm going okay we've imagined this into being it's real now it's, yeah. it's really there we have now spoken it to life we've now made a piece of entertainment about it, a piece of art about it illustrating it this is where I truly feel we're going next. But one of the other interesting things that they touch on in this film was, okay, if these beings communicate telepathically and then language became the, the main way that we communicate, written language, spoken language, well, then logic would say that must, be, that must have been the better way to communicate since that is the species that won out or has mm -hmm. been dominant species but as they point out in the in the series um that would be a, a false leap of logic because in truth what did us blocking ourselves from actually sharing freely without any ability to uh for anyone not to know us fully well it gave us the ability to lie and boy are we seeing that play out right now we, oh yeah our, our our language is is demolished because we've allowed lies to carry the same weight as truth. We've allowed fiction to carry the same weight as fact. And when, when we've done this, and I think as is, is hard as it is for us to understand right now, I think this is good because I think it's forcing us to say, okay, we're going to have to find a better way to communicate. Right. Now, this seems really fantastical again. Okay, let's bring it back to what's being done scientifically right now because I've always felt from my earliest days of getting involved with technology. And, and I've got this weird blend of, yeah, I get technology. I learned how to write code, uh, binary code in high school, but I also really had no super interest in it. Um, I was forced into it when I started uh, writing for a, a magazine. They said, you got to email over your stories to us. I'm like, email, okay. And this was, you know, late eighties. And um, so I, my first computer, I actually went out and bought a $25 word processor at Salvation Army. And I would mail them my floppy disk. <laughs> they're like, no, you're, you're going to have to get a computer. So I got my first Mac. And, and it hit me really strongly that this, used to its best potential, because we're so visual right now and so attached to our five senses, becomes a tool for visualization for us being able to um, reconnect with our own innate abilities and natural technologies, if you will. That's what's happening. Because you've got places like the HeartMath Institute down in Santa Cruz, 
And this isn't, again, some fringe thing. This is being used by the military, is being used by armed forces. And what they're doing is they're able to measure your heart field, which they surmise because they don't have the ability to measure infinitely, that it goes out infinitely. Now, again, back to this frequency thing. Guess what? They've planted these things, magnetometers, which measure this energy, giant ones all over the planet. Oh, yeah. That's the same field that your heart's putting out, that the planet's putting out. So, okay, now we can say we've got exercises, we've got technologies that are now helping us to re-embrace that. There's a company in um, Burlingame called Emotive that's making personal EEG machines so you can rediscover your, where your intuition forms. So we are doing it now. We're using technology to help us divorce ourselves from our things. And I know it doesn't feel like that right now, but I have no doubt that that's where this is ultimately going. You've got places like IONS, Institute for Noetic Sciences, found, founded right. by Edgar Mitchell. Rest his soul, beautiful man, passed away, experienced stuff out in space that he couldn't explain. So he founded this institute just to explore these paranormal paranormal phenomenon. Well, they're proving telepathy, um, uh, telekinesis, all of this stuff, it's real. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're, we're now, we've got that tie in science. Yeah, we can prove it, we can touch and feel it. Now, what are we gonna do with it? Where do we go next? And now I just feel it's like, start with the individual. Now we've got this year, we're, we're all coming together around the celebration of the summer of love and, and love and peace and all the things that come out of that. Now it's time for us to quickly take a deep breath, stop, step back from everything. And that's the one piece of advice I would love to give humanity. I don't have an answer. I don't, I can't solve any problems. Um, I don't have a magic wand, but I do have a suggestion. Stop. Because we won't be able to adjust our course, alter our direction, adapt to where we are until we stop doing the things that are destructive and you can't go full speed in the wrong direction and make a hard right hand turn it just won't work so we you'll crash <laughs> yeah if you, to, you're just to gonna stop. blow it up so yeah, we need to stop and collectively say okay what are we trying to be and then once we ask ourselves that question and if what we're trying to be is extinct, then, hey, let's keep doing what we're doing. We're doing a really good job of that. And, that, and that's fine. You know, it's okay. That's no judgment. If that's what we want to do, then we're, we're well on that path. If we want to continue to expand, if we want a sustainable future for the time that this planet will be, for our, our prodigy into the future, for all life on this planet, then, then we need to talk about what's workable towards that goal. Not what's right or wrong, but what's workable. That's all. Yeah. And believe it or not, the time is winding up and <laughs> with, no, it always like blink of an eye talking with you, Kip. So I want to make sure people know how to get in touch with you, your website, some events that are going on, whatever you want to put out there. So people know how to get in touch with your wonderful work. Um, please. Well, you can find, uh, me on um, uh, on Facebook. Uh, there's two pages that I direct you to. One is Now Share Love, uh, which is our uh, organization sharing solutions, documenting everything that's going on. We're the only media outlet that is documenting everything this 50th anniversary. This is going to be the most amazing documentary when we get this done. And we're estimating, we'll probably wrap shooting the, all of the Summer of Love festivities are going to end in October. And then maybe a year after that, we're going to be putting out this amazing documentary that's tentatively titled um, The Summer of Love, Then to Now, 50, 50 Years of Imagining Utopia. And so that's one of the things we're doing. In the meantime, we're putting out little videos showing people what's going on, giving them a taste in real time of what's happening with The Summer of Love. We went to Florida. We interviewed Jock Fresco of The Venus Project just before he died, 101 years old. And wow. by the way, he, got, got, he had Parkinson's disease. We sat on his bed and got Jock Fresco high on cannabis for the first time and watched the goodness of the medicine wash over him, watch his shaking stop, stop. It was just remarkable. And to be able to have had that experience with Jock, um, I, I just can't even describe how magical that was. So we've got all of these videos. If you go to www.nowsharelove.org, you can see the videos. Um, you can go to YouTube, find Now Share Love. Anything you want to find about Now Share Love, just put in Now Share Love. That's our tag. You can find us easily just by uh, searching that. And again, on Facebook, you can also find my Just Love page, 
which gives my daily writings um, that I, like I said, I haven't missed a day in seven years of, of really trying to help people, trying to share what's shared with me to share. Cause I take no ownership for any of this. It's not about me. I I'm not that smart. I don't know where this stuff comes from. It's like, it's like, I have Ja or universe all the time sending information and going all the time. They're going, wow, that sounds like, a, I'll, I'll go back and I'll read stuff I've written. And I'm like, who wrote that? <laughs> it's like, I know that feeling really well. <laughs> yeah. It's a crazy feeling. I mean, literally like I didn't write that, you know, but anyway, so those are some of the things that, um, I'm doing and and I, I've been doing that as much like when you go back and you can learn from yourself. I'm sharing this to keep myself on the path um, as much as anything else. Um, and, and I want I just want people to really embrace how beautiful they are, how beautiful life is, how that there's nothing to be afraid of. I mean, how can you be a feel scarcity in, in infinity? W what are you imagining here? There is so much abundance. You can be and do anything you want. But I really believe this with all my heart too. You can't, you'll never be able to realize that as long as you're coming from a place of me and ego. As long as you're, it's a, it's a process of reprocess, of reprocity. Uh, you can, you have to give to receive. You can, the, the idea of competing, the one guy winning won't work. It's all about collaboration. So once you've, quote unquote, pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. It's not about you sitting there sing by yourself and going, look how cool I am. I figured it all out because you haven't. It's about going, okay, I feel so much love for myself. I've got to share this with everybody now. And that's exactly. really what it comes down to, moving us from an institutionalized foundation of fear to the love paradigm. Awesome. And you do a wonderful, amazing job. That's why we have to do this more often. I just Anytime. I was looking I was looking through the YouTubes because in the description I put links to the other um, times you've been on the show so people can find our other conversations. Um, I I want them to understand the history and we've been repeating a lot of the same messages for years now. Yeah. So um, I thank you. You're very empowering. And with that, this is Jennifer Hellman. If you want to get in touch with me, love it's <laughs> love to you. Um, you can find me on jenniferhellman.com. And with that, with each breath of air, I hope you find inspiration, information, and insights to expand the world you create. Till next time, have a beautiful day. And thank you again, Kit Baldwin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.